I'm here today with uh, one of my boot camp coaches, actually Chris Benson. Uh, I'll introduce you to Chris in a second, but basically he has recently won the British Middleweight Mixed Martial Arts Championship, and he has the belt as well, which we'll, we'll, we'll show you in a second. And uh, I've asked Chris to spend a few minutes with me today because I want to talk about some of the training that he did leading up to it and some of the dedication and discipline. Because I've never, I've, I've always been the, 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 the persuasion of running away. And uh, Chris has got his own special reasons for wanting to stand <laughs> wanting to stand in the fight. But anyway, Chris, good to, good to have you. Thanks for spending some time. My pleasure. Um, I, I do have to say, uh, uh, shortly after winning this fight, which was a month, six weeks ago, a uh, couple of months ago? Yeah, a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's since been off games because he's broken the rib. <laughs> which, uh, you see, you actually heard a, a snap, an actual snapping sound as the rib went, did you? Yeah. I was... Uh fighting with the team Great Britain and someone was trying out for the heavyweight slot. So a few weight categories above me and uh, he's trying to impress everyone. So we're going a bit harder than he normally would and he threw me on the floor and uh, there was a nice snapping noise came from one of my floating ribs, which was quite unpleasant. Yeah, and that does completely put you out of action really, doesn't it? For Yeah, it's been a month a of, I always try to stay busy. So if I can't do the physical side of things, I'm always studying uh, tapes, kind of the instructional things, there's a lot online and um, watching a lot of fights you can actually learn quite a lot about strategy and so on and um, uh, really into watching a lot of documentaries so I've been doing that for the last month. So you're not just sitting <laughs> in your backside putting all that weight you lost? <laughs> <laughs> I put on a lot of weight definitely. We'll, we'll talk about that as well actually, because nutrition is something that's obviously very important to, to, to all sports but uh, for you when you've got to make a weight then it's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical. Focus. Um, but it's a good job that that rib break didn't happen a few weeks previously because you, you spent a long time preparing for this for this fight. How how long did you dedicate yourself to getting in, in into fight shape? About twelve weeks. I mean, a normal fight camp is six weeks, but it's been a little bit of a while since my last fight. So yeah, about twelve weeks, and that's broken down into different phases of training. Okay, and you you, you weren't on a par with this, your, your opponent either, you were a bit of an underdog. Yeah, I mean, it'd been a while since I'd fought. I've been competing in other martial arts, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and staying quite active, but uh, I hadn't had a fight in a little while. So I spoke to my coach and said, can you organize a fight for me, maybe on the undercard to get my foot in, with the idea of going for a title eventually, but to uh, have a few fights first and get, get a little bit more experience. And uh, they said, we got you a fight, but you're going to fight for a British title. And I, the other guy, yeah, was got a much bigger record than me, much more experience. But uh, I thought, I watched his tapes and decided that I definitely had the ability to beat him. There was areas where he was very weak, where I'm very strong. So, so you had that confidence that you, you at least had a shot of, of coming out on top. As yeah, the case. I think when you get close to the fight, you, you kind of, you build up a level of confidence, which isn't realistic to your ability. So you kind of... You definitely, you wouldn't go into a cage where someone's allowed to hit you as hard as they like unless you were th th thought you were going to win. But that stage when you're, you know, 12 weeks out and you're being offered the fight, you can be a bit more realistic about your abilities, the other guy's abilities and make a kind of educated decision. And even if the other guy looks a bit better, you've got 12 weeks to work on wherever it is you think your weaknesses are and to, um, you know, how to avoid his strengths. Okay, well, tell me a bit more about the training because you say there's a 12-week camp that you you put yourself into and it wasn't it was broken into three different phases what would how did that differ to how would you would normally keep yourself conditioned you know through the rest of the year when you're not leading up to a big fight so everything is a lot more structured there's definitely a, a plan to it whereas normally there's a little bit there's a plan to how i train but it's what you're in the mood for and with the 12 weeks, it's the first month is just a, it's kind of a strength phase. So it's a lot of heavy lifting, Olympic lifting, um, a lot of kettlebells, uh, and you're not so worried about the weight at that stage. So you can eat a lot and have a lot of protein, but when you're lifting heavy, you're still trying to stay within yourself. You're not trying to go to absolute failure because then it might be that you're lifting weights in the morning and then you've got an hour of boxing, an hour of jiu-jitsu, an hour of wrestling in the evening. So you need to save some energy uh, for that. So you, it's kind of it's kind of finding that line of overtraining and staying just below it. You know, it's not. That, that's a bit different to the usual way of training, which is well, you've got three sessions a week. You've got yeah. to beast yourself for each of those three sessions. Yeah. Here, you've got to get the right amount of stimulus, holding back just enough that it doesn't compromise sessions later on in the day. I mean, how many times a day were you were you training most days? Normally, three or four.
four times a day. Each day? So like a normal training, you push yourself as hard as you can, you've got 48 hours to recover. I've got hours to recover before the next. There might be a technical training, but the technical training is still very physical. If you're technical training boxing, hitting pads, that's an incredibly physical ex exercise mm. for an hour, so you really need a lot of energy for it. And within that, you've, you've obviously got to keep yourself fueled. You mentioned there the, the, the early stages where yeah. it doesn't really matter so much. It's still a good way out and you can eat much more and you can keep yourself fueled up with protein. Now, you're a vegetarian as well. Are you a complete vegetarian or do you I eat fish? fish. Yeah. You, so pescatarian. Then, pescatarian. Get the terminology right. right here. <laughs> so you're a pescatarian, but not eating meat. I mean, how much, of a, how much more effort does that require for you to put into your diet to not get any, the easy protein sources of chicken and, and, and beef. I mean, what I do around the fight camp is I want to know exactly what I'm putting in my body. So to a, to a very t tiny degree. So I tend to just eat the same meals over and over again. So a, a classic for me was scrambled eggs with salsa is like a, a standard go-to breakfast for me. And I would probably have that six days a week. And right. for me, a standard dinner is a, a large piece of salmon with uh, mixed cruciferous vegetables. And yeah, the same thing. I probably have that five or six days a week. It's very boring, but you know exactly what's going in your body. At, at what point does it come become a point where? Because I mean, I've you know been out with you before, and we've had beers and uh, you know, Christmas dinners and all that sort of thing. So uh, I know you don't eat like that all the time. Mm. How how has how does that differ to what you would normally be eating? I mean, now for example, you're off yeah. off plan. What's your is your <laughs> diet pretty good still now? Or? I mean, my diet's fairly good, but. There's, there's treats that go into it, but I mean, there's nothing as motivating as thinking that you, you're going to get in a cage with someone who's going to hurt you. So if you're not at your best, if you're not at your most physical, that's the motivation. So there's the motivation to look good, there's the motivation for, but the motivation of someone trying to hurt you, there's no compromise for that. There's no, yeah, there's there's no, no better motivator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's, uh, that's true. Like I said, I've always been one to, to run away. And run marathons, <laughs> and that sort of thing. But well, I have the same attitude. <laughs> but, but the thing is, I mean, I, I would train for maybe twelve weeks for a a ten k or a half marathon or a full marathon, and um, and then the race itself will take well hours, yeah, potentially hours, depending on the, the distance. Whereas, I mean, how, you train for twelve weeks. How long were you in the ring for with your opponent? How long did the fight last for? Three minutes twenty one seconds. So three minutes, <laughs> just every three minutes. I mean, how, how does that compute in your in your head when you think? You know, you do go through all that for actually three minutes of, of um, physical time. Is that kind of is there any disconnect there that you you find, or is it is that the, the goal is to make that last as short a time as possible? It's to uh, the time thing is it's one way of looking at it. It, it is a short amount of time, and um, you do enjoy it when you're in there. Like you feel very invincible because the adrenaline. You get hit, you get hit hard. You'll feel it later. You'll feel it the next day, but at the time. It's an incredible feeling. Like before, is nervous, and then afterwards you have a you have a bit of a come down. But during the actual fight, is a is a great feeling. What if you can force yourself to get there? But it, I've always had that attitude in my life. A little bit of a wish, uh, risk taker of it's better to live a day as a lion than a lifetime as a worm. That's a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant phrase. I'm going to steal that one as well. <laughs> but I told my friend that, and he said, "Wow, you never heard of a worm skin rug?" And I was like, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true as well. <laughs> So, I mean, what, what's next? Obviously, the ribs got to heal, and uh, what, what's what's next for you? Uh, I got a lot of plans. Um, I got a baby on the way, so I'm focusing a little mm. bit more on my business and making money. But um, I'm definitely going to go to America and compete at the World Jiu Jitsu Championships. Um, it's a very high level, so I have to really focus on that. And that, that's the next big target. Uh, I think I'm going to have to defend the belt at some point. Let's have a look at the belt because uh, it really is a big, big, big old belt. And um, yeah, and you get to keep this, right? You don't yep. have to hand that back yep. or anything. So have you got many more of these or is that, is that the best one? That's the only, only belt I've got. I've got. I've got a good trophy collection, but it's the yeah. only belt I've got. <laughs> so you go to defend that. That'll be, that'll be one of the next things. And you mentioned there about going to uh, America and doing this uh, um, World Jiu-Jitsu yep. Champs. Is that as a part of a national team? Then? No, no. That is, um, I mean, it's... It's open to anyone, so it's a knockout tournament. So as opposed to the, the fight for this, where it's there's a bit more risk because you can hit each other and stuff. But I'm the best out of two people, so that's the the nature of it. Whereas when I go to the World Championships, there might be 80 people in my category, oh, right. and it's a knockout tournament to decide who's the best. So I've got to be the best of 80. So and you have to fight multiple times in the day. So it's definitely a different kind of training. And saying about three minutes, this could be that could be you know, eight or 
nine three minute six seven minute matches yeah yeah and uh, mixed martial arts isn't it's not an Olympic sport, is it? No, but not yet. But they're trying, yeah, they're trying to get it up to that point where it's an Olympic sport. Tell us a little bit more about that. So yeah, I mean, they they've taken out wrestling out of the Olympics. Uh, they just announced that a few a few months ago, and judo's changed its rules dramatically. Um, so this, I feel that there's this big gap that's unrepresentative of how big mixed martial arts has got. I mean, in the UK, it's it's kind of growing still. But in America, it's, it outsells boxing on the pay per views every wow. every time. I think nine out of the ten biggest pay per views in the states last year were mixed martial arts events. Right. You know, it's huge, and the money's becoming huge, and the exposure. And um, in the original Olympics, they had uh, pancreation or pancration. I don't know quite how to pronounce it, but um, it was a combination of uh, boxing and wrestling, which is right. basically uh, a version of what mixed martial Full arts. Bear of mixed yeah. martial arts. Yeah. So, they did it naked, which I'm not so keen on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Bring back naked. They wrestling. were they were trying to put that the, the traditional form back in the Olympics, and they had trials for it. And I was uh, I was on the British team, but it never got through the selection stages to end up back in the Olympics. But um, I think it will get there eventually. It probably I'll probably miss the generation that you know goes yeah. in because it will take. But the next the next um, Olympics is in Brazil, and I think they will uh, try and have Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as a demo. There. Right, a demo sport, and that makes up a major part of mixed martial arts. So, they definitely help get it in. So you say that about kind of the next generation, and you're you're involved with training the next generation yep. through your karate, uh, your karate uh, clubs, and and all the other things you, that you mm -hmm. you do with that. So, and um, you know, how many students do you have that, that work with you at the moment? Uh, what age range are they? I mean, we have four year olds. They're not learning like cage fighting as such. That's like a traditional martial arts kids class where we're focusing on coordination things, but i got a few adults as well. I mean, across the, the age group, um, we've probably got about 120 students now. Yeah. And it, it's, it's one of those things that's great to train, even if you have no intention of competing. I put no pressure on my students to compete. I don't think you need to uh, compete. It's a bit like running. You can go for a jog and enjoy it. You don't have to go and do a marathon yeah. or a 10K. And there's probably more enjoyment you get out of it because there's no pressure. You're not training for anything. It's just the joy of it. There's a lot of discipline obviously, mm -hmm. and you mentioned other things there about coordination, and uh, presumably there's a fair amount of balance, yep. flexibility, and it's a very anaerobic sport as well, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, both karate and jiu-jitsu and uh, yeah. mixed martial arts, it's, it's not that long, which I'm used to kind of going for a run, and just extending the time, whereas it's, it's shorter bursts, very, yeah. very high intensity work, so. And it's because it's, I mean, it's such a, a modern sport that the training for it's constantly evolving, and uh, you're seeing I think because of mixed martial arts, kettlebells coming back into fashion, uh, yeah. battle ropes, or Bulgarian bags, even even the TRX and things are kind of, especially in America, they're publicised by MMA fighters. Right. Yeah. So these functional training aids, yeah. that personal trainers use, uh, kind of really in integral to the the coaching and the training for even CrossFit. Mixed I think arts. is very popular because so many mixed martial artists training it. Right, okay, well, that's interesting. Even though I don't agree, I think it's a bit too hard on your body. But <laughs> <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> that's fine. Um, it, it must be quite inspirational then for your students of, of all ages to see you up there competing at the highest level and then coming back and, and, and coaching them and training them. There must be something more than just the, just the, the, the technical advice that you give. Do you find that, that that role model position that you have mm. kind of, filters over, kind of carries over to, to motivating your students as well? What I want to get across to my students is that it's if I ever win anything, it's because I've trained harder than the other guy. It's a, you know, a question of wanting it more, being more disciplined. And whenever I go and I compete and I lose, and uh, it does happen, I'm not one of those undefeated people, I, uh, I make a point of it and I say I lost and this is what I've learned from that. You know, it, it, and it's the same if you're a runner and you go and do your, your marathon and your times off where it was last year or off where you want it to be, it's just breaking it down and saying, what did I do wrong? What's, uh, how can I improve? And it's that sometimes uh, people's ego or arrogance gets in the way, probably less so in running uh, general fitness, but a huge amount in fighting where they, they blame the referee and they blame the weather and they were sick or their, their uh, girlfriend had to go at them or there's all these kind of external things they blame because they can't, their ego can't take it, they come up short. Whereas I have the opposite, you know, I, I want to come up short. I want to learn from everything. Even even the fight I won in three minutes, I watched it back and I, like there's plenty of 
things I do wrong in three minutes that I can take away and improve on. So it's constantly learning and everything you do. I mean, they always say that failures are your best teachers yeah. rather than your successes. It's very easy to become complacent if you're constantly achieving and you, you, you don't see what the, you know, where, where the areas are that you can improve on. So, and that's, that's kind of, that's something that extends well into, well beyond the, the, the remit of mixed martial arts or running or sport in general. It's something that's a life thing, really. Yeah. It's a real kind of parallel there with, um, with, with any aspect of, of life. So. And I must admit, fighting has changed my, as a teenager, I was, uh, I was probably quite arrogant and um, very sure of myself, based on almost nothing, if I, <laughs> if I look at it. And uh, taking up martial arts and uh, having your own limitations put so obviously in front of you, um, physical and mental, it's a, it's a really humbling experience and some people can't take it, but for me, it was just, it was just great to see that. And it, it put me on a kind of, took me down a peg as it were, and yeah. uh, put me in control of my ego. And now when I train, I just look for people that can beat me. I train with boxers that put me in my place, um, my team, Great Britain boxers, Olympic boxers. And uh, I got an incredible boxing coach, uh, Stuart Scott, and we spar and he just, Beats the crap out of me. <laughs> I mean, you, don't, you, don't, you don't just like stick to local coaches. You, you can no, all drive bro. all over, don't you? You're looking for the best. Yeah, like I said, fields. train with top uh, boxing coaches. Uh, I go to London, train with Roger Gracie, who's the the best jiu-jitsu fighter on the planet, and in my opinion, the best fighter on the planet. But uh, I'm a bit biased. Um, and yeah, sometimes I'm traveling for two or three hours for an hour's training, but because of the quality of people you're training with, it makes all the difference. That's my advice for other people is to try and find the best, the best coaches you can. It makes such a difference. Well, travelling, as long as you're back for boot camps, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't mind. <laughs> so, Chris, mate, thanks very much for spending some time. Thank you, George. My pleasure. And, um, it's great having you uh, on, the, on the, the boot camp team. Thanks Thank you.